Well, welcome back to our study in the book of Romans. Uh, remember, we're in Romans chapter 1. We missed last week because of the uh, following, uh, but we went up to verse 17, which was, you know, obviously a monumental verse that we ended in when he says that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That was um, a verse that really opened the heart of Martin Luther, the great reformer, uh, that really spurred on the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, although the, the Protestant Reformation was bigger than Martin Luther, that was part of it, this verse. So um, as we're going through, and he's talking about the gospel and how we have the, the power of God's forgiveness in our lives, all of a sudden he jumps in verse 18. It's kind of a new subsection uh, as we're moving along. Uh, before we get to that, I just want to remind you guys that we are, so today I'm going to do Romans uh, chapter 1, 18 through 23. I want to remind you guys that we're, I'm using the New King James Version, just in case uh, you didn't, you have a different Bible, it might, the words might be a little bit different. Um, so if you guys could have it, or if you guys have an app, open up to New King James. Um, and then I also want to remind you about the book of Romans, how the book of Romans is broken up uh, quite nicely into three main sections. So we are in the beginning of the first section, obviously the beginning of the book. Uh, but chapters 1 through 8 talk about really God's plan of salvation, or we could talk about justification by faith. And then uh, we get into 9 through 11. Chapters 9 through 11 really focus in on the nation of Israel and God's sovereignty in the midst of that, which is some really, it's got some really heavy theology, um, which is, will be exciting and challenging But when we get to that point. And then uh, the last kind of basically four chapters, um, 12 through 16, is basically practical application. Although chapter 16 is a lot of greetings and salutations and things like that as well. So we are at the very beginning, and God uh, wants to, wow, that's not good. So if anybody knows a place that you can fix your Bible, that would be awesome, because my Bible is falling apart. I need a book binder. So um, we are at the beginning, we're talking about God's plan of salvation, but in order to get to God's plan of salvation, and this is something that's very important that we must understand, God has to lay out the bad news about human nature before he gets in and begins to explain the good news about what he's done. It's like trying to explain a remedy or a cure or a vaccine or something like that for some disease without a person understanding the disease. We have to understand what we have first in order to understand the power of the cure and how the cure is going to work. And so he is going to work, starting here in verse 18, get into some really heavy stuff. Um, chapter 1, 2, and 3 all go through and really lay out some really um, dark explanations of human nature and who we are as human beings, being utterly sinful. Um, some would use the word depraved, which we'll talk about more as we get to chapter 3. And it starts right here in chapter 1, verse 18. So what I'll do is I'll read this for you. We'll read this passage. You guys can follow along with me. And then we will um, break it down and, and go through and explain it. So Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So he starts off here after talking about the power of the gospel and talking about how the righteousness of God is revealed by faith. He picks up in verse 18, he says, the wrath of God is revealed 
from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So as we pick up here in verse 18, he hits us right in the face, right in the first verses. It's just slap, slap. God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness, unrighteousness of men. And you look at that and you go, wow, that's really heavy. Okay. Now, what are we talking about here? Well, um, there are different forms of God's wrath. And I can't get too much into this because most of this is going to be for next week's message as we get to the end of, well, as we get to the end of chapter one. Um, but there are different forms of wrath. And I want to show you a couple of verses here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. It says, uh, obviously in the middle of the passage, it says, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So in 2 Thessalonians, it's talking about persecution that's coming against believers in Thessalonica. And Paul is writing to them to encourage them, saying, hey, this is a sign of the blessing that you have as a believer, that people are against you because they're against God. And so if you're walking with God, they're going to be against you. And so rejoice in that. And he, then he says, not only that, but God is going to repay these people who are coming against you. He's going to repay them. And what he says here, he says, they, these people who are persecuting him, persecuting the believers, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Okay, this is talking about hell. Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So they have eternal destruction, which is hellfire. And he talks about them being separated from the presence of God for all eternity. Okay, now here on earth, in a sense, people are separated, but this will be a, a permanent fixture, right? This is something that is, is undoable, right? So these guys here on earth, they get to experience the presence of God around them because God is everywhere. And as God pours out goodness upon his people like us, he also pours out his goodness on the unrighteous. So if he makes it rain upon us, he makes it rain upon the unrighteous as well. So they're experiencing grace. They're experiencing the goodness of God, even though they're separated from him with their sins. But once they enter into eternity, that's gone. There's no more common grace. There's no more goodness of God. There's no more of his presence around them. It is eternal separation from the presence of God in eternal destruction. Okay? This is God's wrath, right? This is not what we're talking about in Romans 1, but this is one form of God's wrath. Okay? Another example of this is Revelation 21.8. Revelation 21.8 says this, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexual, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So this is the lake of fire, right? This is, this is heavy. This is the end. This is where uh, Hades and... Um, is Hades and... No, my mind just went blank. Um, well, Hades comes, Hades and death come and they empty out the dead that are in them and they surrender them to God who puts them into judgment into the lake of fire, which is the ultimate death, right? This is what they call the second death. First death is a physical death. Second death is a spiritual death, right? This is the wrath of God. Okay. This is the wrath. These two examples are the wrath of God. This is not exactly what he's talking about. This is an eternal wrath. Okay. Eternal wrath. Okay. But we continue on. Look at me in Proverbs 11.31. In Proverbs 11.31, it says this, If the righteous will be recompensed on the earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinners? You see, this is what God is talking about. There is a wrath of God that he is bringing upon sinners here on earth that's different from the eternal wrath, which is hellfire, right? And so what he's saying is God is judging sins even though it seems like we don't see that. And that's what happens, right? Some of the Psalms talk about how people are experiencing blessings. Like it seems like the, the evildoers are always prospering. And he says, how, how, I, I see that and I get frustrated. The Psalm is talking about this in several different Psalms. And what happens? In the end, they realize, well, in the end, they're, they're going to pay the price for their sins. Well, what happens is we don't see it. 
But these guys are living their lives, and they're, they're living contrary to the ways of God. Eventually, God is going to bring his wrath against them, okay? And this is going to be a, a, a judgment wrath, um, a wrath that comes against them to pay the price for their sins here on earth, and then they're going to go, and they're going to experience an eternal wrath, which comes against them in hell. So God is not playing around with sin, and I think that's the problem that so many people, they see the goodness of God, they see the grace of God, and then they think, oh, I can do whatever I want. There's no consequence for it. Oh, well, there's huge consequences for it. Eventually, your sin will catch up to you, right? Always. And that's even, you know, in other parts of the Bible. Um, Paul talks about that to Timothy. He says, he says that the, the sin will always follow the people. Like, eventually, they will be revealed, right? So this is an important reminder. We, if we are doing what is right, we will be recompensed here on earth and eternally as we get to heaven. Fantastic. But he says, how much more the ungodly and the sinner? They too will be recompensed here on earth and in eternity when they arrive, uh, unfortunately, stand before God. Okay, now, there's another form of wrath which is connected to this, and that's in Galatians chapter 6. If you guys look there, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, it says this, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. So as he's going through here, this is sort of a, call it a consequential wrath. Consequential wrath is you're experiencing the consequences of your decisions. Every decision that we make, every single decision has a, a response, a consequence, okay? If you do something good, there will be a positive consequence. If you do something bad, there will be a negative consequence. This is fact, okay? Uh, some people will call it the law of seed time and harvest, that whatever you plant, that's what's going to grow, right? And Jesus talks about that. Planting bad seeds, there's going to be bad fruit or bad crops that come from that. If you plant good seeds, you're going to have good crops or good fruit that comes from that. So he says, the idea is that we need to not lose heart, but we need to continue to do good. And he says, especially those who are of the household of God. So especially us who are in the church. So bless your brothers and sisters, do good to them. And he says, there's, there's going to be good consequences that come your way. Now, this is true. I, I remember my dad was a real estate agent for a while, and uh, he planned as, you know, this, this big thing for, for Christmas. He planned a food drive. And so he was going through the neighborhood and talking to people as a way of him getting to know people and getting his name out there. And uh, he had this food drive, and they were collecting food, and they were going to donate it to, uh, I don't remember the, where they donated exactly, but it was to some, something to help out people who were in need in the, uh, during the holiday season. And uh, he brought in so many boxes of food, so many canned foods and, and packaged foods and all this non-perishable food items. And I remember him telling me so many times, he said, man, it felt so good to do that. It felt so good to do that. And I said, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, because he was doing something good. And it just, it gave him joy to bless others. And he experienced a positive consequence of that. Now, he might have even gotten his name out a little bit in the community that people say, hey, that guy, he's doing all right. Because he's, he's trying to help other people. I like that guy. Maybe he can sell my house for me. Um, I don't know if he got any business from that. But, um, but, but this is something that comes. There are positive consequences. Every time we sin, there's a negative consequence. Sometimes it's, it's very small. Sometimes it's huge. Sometimes it's life-altering, right? You hear about people drink too much, get out on the highway, crash their car, kill somebody, or kill themselves, right? Huge consequence because of one bad decision right? So we have to be careful because all of our actions have consequences, okay? So this is part of God's wrath as well. He established this system on earth that there is a consequence for everything we do. We reap what we sow. You guys have all heard that, I'm sure, in the church, right? We reap what we sow. So we have to be very careful. Now, um, there are examples of this in the Bible where people begin to suffer the consequences of their decisions, right? So, um, 2 Samuel chapter 24, story of David, okay? 2 Samuel 24, verses 11 through 13. 
It says, now, when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer. This was his prophet, right? Saying, go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months from your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days of plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I shall take back to him who sent me. So the prophet Gad comes to David and he says, okay, here's what's going on. This is following David's disastrous decision to have an affair with Bathsheba and then to kill her husband, Uriah the Hittite, who was a righteous man, right? And David, acting sneakily, not following the Lord's orders because he wasn't out when the kings were supposed to be out fighting battles. He was hanging around his house doing nothing, right? You know the old saying, idleness is the devil's playground, right? That is true. It's not biblical, but it is true, man. They have a, um, it's almost the exact same thing in Portuguese. They'll say, um, an empty mind is the devil's workshop. And I was like, yeah, that's, it's almost the exact same thing. And it's true. Uh, we saw all sorts of problems rise up when COVID came. All of a sudden, all these people not working, sitting at home, all of a sudden getting stirred up on all these little things. And I, yeah, you know, these guys at the church, I'm sick of this. Yeah. And then they start work, talking together and they start getting worked up. And then all of a sudden we get all these dramas start coming up in our church. We're like, what is going on? Because all these people have free time. What are they, what are they doing free time? They're supposed to be at work right? And so then all of a sudden, this empty mind, nothing to do, endless free time, they start causing trouble, right? So David had this. And God came and he said, listen, I'm going to give you a choice, which is not normal. God doesn't usually do that. But he gave David a choice. You choose of these three things. What am I going to do to you as a result, a consequence for your sins? Oh, well, that's, that's pretty heavy. To choose a consequence of sin that's going to affect other people, right? And, and, Basically, that's what David says at the end of the passage, which is um, later on. He says, he, he says, you know, like th this, what, you're doing this, Lord, against your people, but like it was me that sinned, right? And, and that's true. David sinned, and God gave him an option to choose. Now, in the New Testament, we see this as well. So Acts chapter 13, verses 8 through 11. Acts chapter 13, Paul is out. He has just been sent. Paul and Barnabas have been sent out on their first missionary journey, and they meet this guy, Elimus. And Elimus was a sorcerer, okay? So it says, but Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul against, away from the faith. Then Paul, who also is called, Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Man, this story is crazy. Paul gets the opportunity to talk to a Roman official, okay? And he's going out. He has the opportunity to share the gospel, but he has this this counselor, this sorcerer who's there aiding him in his ministry to the people. And so Paul's there preaching, and this sorcerer is trying to turn the proconsul away from the message of the gospel. And Paul, after seeing this for a while, says, oh, you're going to harden your heart against God? You're going to try to resist what God's doing? You're going to try to block someone else from hearing the gospel? No way. And so Paul says, now you're going to be blind for a season. And this darkness falls on him. And then all of a sudden, the guy's freaking out, trying to find somebody to guide him. I don't know if you guys have been in that, where all of a sudden, the lights get turned off and you can't see anything. It's a terrifying feeling. And you're trying to find something that you can grab onto because you're, you're thinking, am I going to fall? Am I going to trip? Is someone right in front of me? You know, um, That's what this guy got to experience. Why? It was a consequence of his sin. How heavy is that? So... I'm, I'm laying out all these examples because I want to make sure that you guys understand this is what God does. We see examples of it, example after example after example, all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then we see Paul explaining this 
back in Romans 1.18 that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. All of it. So people look like they're getting away with their sins. They're not. They're not going to get away with it. Don't worry. And so this is one of the reasons why over and over in the Bible they tell us, don't venge yourselves. Don't, don't go out. Leave vengeance for God, right? That's not your job as a Christian to get that guy back. And some of us, we have that nature, right? We're just like, they did that to me. That's it. I'm going to get them back so bad, right? And, and God is saying, no, don't do that. Leave that for me because God's eventually going to pay them back for that sin if they don't repent from it, right? And even if they repent from it, there's still going to be a consequence of their sin. They might not know it's from that sin, but there is a consequence. So we need to sit back and say, okay, let's let God do his thing. And we rest in his sovereignty and his power, his judgment, knowing that he's going to pay back people that we couldn't pay back, right? Um, Or that we should not pay back. So back to the passage, uh, 118, I'm sorry. Uh, So in Romans 118, he says, the wrath of God is revealed, right? Which we're seeing these examples of this happening, but it's revealed against those, look at the very end, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And, and this right here is the key, those who suppress the truth, right? And I, I know there's different consequences of sin. Uh, one of the things that Jesus talked about, he says that the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who had an understanding of the law that was unparalleled with anybody else, that they would have a greater condemnation. And you look at that and you say, greater condemnation? What does that mean? Like greater than hell? Is there, are there different levels of hell? And that's where some of you guys have read the, the great work Dante's Inferno, um, which was that, you know, middle, I guess it was in the Middle Ages, uh, that great literary work by Dante. Um, and he talks about the seven levels of heaven. Well, the Bible doesn't say there's seven levels of heaven. That's not real. But there does seem to be different consequences. So how does that work? We don't know. So Dante took artistic liberty and kind of ran with it and wrote a book, um, which we can't do that uh, as theologians. But what we do is we look at it and we say, wow, there are different consequences of sin. And so that's heavy. And what we see here is that these guys are being judged here in Romans 118 because they are suppressing the truth, suppressing the truth, okay? Um, the word suppress is rather important to us. It means to restrain or withhold, okay? restrain or withhold. And so this is the example that we saw with Elimus, Elimus, the the sorcerer. He was restraining the truth from getting to the proconsul. He didn't want him to understand because if he believes in the gospel, he's not going to listen to Elimus, the sorcerer. And Elimus has a position of, of influence. And so nobody who has a position of influence wants to lose their position of influence, right? It's very difficult for us as human beings. So he begins to restrain the truth and try to prevent the proconsul from understanding. And what happens? Paul brings the wrath of God on him right there in that very moment, and he becomes blind, okay? So this is what God's talking about. God is, or Paul is explaining that God brings his wrath against people when they begin to suppress the truth, okay? When they begin to suppress the truth. And we'll come back to this idea uh, in just a little bit, okay? So let's move ahead, move on. Romans 119, says this. It says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Okay? So, the things of God can be known to us. Things of God. Not everything, because God is so much bigger than us. Um, But he reveals certain things to us, and that's what it says. He says, uh, the things of God may be known because it is manifest in us as human beings, because God has shown it to human beings. This word manifest and shown is the exact same word in the Greek. It just doesn't make sense when we leave them the same in the, in the English, so they put two different words in there. It's the exact same word in the Greek. So he's saying things have been shown to human beings because God showed it to them. God is revealing himself to the world. Why does God do that? Because God desires that we get to know him. That's the God that we serve. He doesn't, he's not an impersonal God who's off doing his own thing. He is a God who is desiring to have a relationship with us. He's desiring for us as human beings to understand who he is and his greatness, right? And this is very complicated because we as human beings, we are so tiny, 
and our brains are so small. I mean, really, we have, they say we have about a three pound brain, about three pounds, right? And so this little three pound brain that we don't even understand everything and about how it works, we're trying to understand an infinite God. How do we do that? There's no way that we can understand an infinite God unless he reveals himself to us. And that's what he's doing here. There, there's a, a passage in, in Acts that I think is absolutely fantastic. Acts 17, verses 26 and 27. Acts 20, 17, verses 26 and 27. It says this. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Here, Paul is speaking to the Athenians, and he is trying to relate to them on their level, their philosophers. And so he comes in, and he says, listen, I want you to understand the God that I preach to you. He is the unknown God that you guys made an idol for. You guys made a statue for the unknown God because you didn't want to miss out on any of the gods. But I'm telling you who he is. He is the creator of all the universe. And he says he comes through, and he said from one blood, from Adam and Eve, he created every nation of men who dwell on the face of the earth. Think about that, right? He's confirming the message of Genesis. And then he says, and God has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Think about that. God has determined the pre-appointed times and boundaries of nations? It's not just some, some random crapshoot that's going on in the world. And Well, I think this land's good for us. We'll take that, and you guys take that. That's not how it works. God has predetermined where people will be. And so you think, like, well, so the Babylonians, they were there, and, and they were powerful in that region around the Euphrates and the Tigris River, and, and God had appointed they would be the greatest at that point. But then he also appointed that after him, the Medo-Persian Empire would rise up and they would conquer the Babylonians and that they would be right next to the Babylonians and end up moving into their territory. God determined that. And you look at that and you go, wow, well, that's, that's a lot bigger than I thought, right? If you think about the England and how England expanded all across the world, it was the, the empire that the sun never set upon. It was God that was ordaining that, that he had set them. And then through that came us as the United States, that God said, yeah, one of them will branch off and is going to be, become greater than England, which is, was impossible to imagine when we first began, right? God has all of this, our boundaries determined. So then what happens? He says, well, why did he do that? He did that so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. So God put them in certain places in order that people would be able to find him find God. This is who God is, right? He wants to reveal himself to mankind. And it's our job to seek him, to grope for him that we might find him. And he says, he is, though he is not far from each one of us. He's not far from any of us. All around the world, God is there waiting to be found by people who would grope for him and find him, right? So God has a plan he begins to reveal himself to the world because he wants them to know him. They, he wants them to experience that relationship with their creator. So then when we look at Romans 119, and he says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. God is revealing himself to the people of the world. And as he begins to reveal himself, people are starting to know, wow, this is the creator God. This is the God of the universe, and they're starting to know him and experience him in a very personal way, and that's what we have through Jesus Christ, obviously, um, although I'm getting ahead of myself there. All right. Um, one of the things that he says, too, you know, obviously, is 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. It says this, for this is, a, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. God desires that all men would be saved. That's his plan. And so what does he do? He pre-appoints, preordains the nations to be in certain times and certain areas of the world in order they would be able to find him and know the truth and be saved from their sins. This is the God we have. He's, he's a God. He's a seeker. He's opening himself up to seek after people so that people could come to know him and experience the grace and forgiveness that he has through Jesus Christ. How awesome is that? 
God is doing everything throughout the history of the world to reveal himself to men because he desires that none would be, sa- or none would be lost, that all would be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. You go, wow, that's amazing. That's a good God, right? That's who we want to serve, and that's, that's who we do serve. Okay, back in the passage, Romans 1.20. It says this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So as God comes in and he begins to reveal himself to us, um, he says that his attributes, his invisible attributes are clearly seen since the time of creation in the creation, okay? So again, he takes us back to Genesis at the creation. And he says, as God created everything, what is he doing? He's leaving his fingerprint on everything that's made. And so when you see the details of all creation, you look at that and you say, wow, there is an intelligent designer who is doing this, right? Have you guys ever looked at a cell? You guys, I don't know if you guys had that in biology, uh, but we'd look at cells. We look at plant cells. We look at animal cells. Uh, and see the difference, right? And you start to see, oh, wow, look at that. And they, we start pointing out things, and we start having to draw pictures and, and you know, diagram it in order to identify each of the pieces, right? You say, oh, well, there's the mitochondria, and this is the cell wall, and you're going through all these things. And, and what are you doing? You're seeing the intricacy that this leaf has. There's a, there's a leaf, but it's made up of millions of these tiny cells, and these cells are made up of all this beautiful, amazing things that work together perfectly to multiply it and allow the leaf to grow. And that leaf grows, why? Because there's probably some animal that needs to eat it in order that it could be fed and that it could grow, and it's getting the nutrients from the plant that God designed from those little tiny cells. And you look at that and you just go, wow, this is amazing. This is God's fingerprint on creation. And he says that through the things that are made, we look at it and we say, wow, you can see certain attributes and certain invisible attributes of God, okay? Now, what are those attributes? Well, he says here that it is his eternal power and Godhead, okay? Now, I wish the New King James would have changed Godhead because it's not a word that we've used. We, We don't use that in our everyday vocabulary, you know? Um, so when you're driving around, you're like, you know, I was thinking about the Godhead today, and uh, I was wondering, you know, people are like, what? Godhead? What does that mean? Um, the word Godhead means divinity. It means that God has a divine nature. He's not human. He's not earthly, right? He is divine. He is beyond us. And not only that, but he is eternal. We see his eternal power. The word power here is the word dunamis, which we already saw in the first two sections Uh, when we were going through Romans. God's power and its eternal power is revealed through creation. Now, this is interesting because the Psalms talk about this. Look at Psalm 19. This is just the first four verses. Psalm 19, verses one through four. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge there is no speech or, nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So he says here, the heavens, the skies are declaring the glory of God. And there's no language on earth that doesn't hear this. There's no language. They say, well, you know, he only speaks Russian. So in order for you to understand what the firmament are saying, you got to speak Russian. And it's like, no, no, no. We can look as Americans speaking English, we can look up at the sky and we can still see the handiwork of God. We can see the heavens declaring God's glory. And that's good, right? Because we don't speak a lot of languages as Americans, right? You guys know that joke? Like, what do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual, right? What do you call someone who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call someone who speaks one language? American, yeah. (laughs) It's sad but true, right? So... The heavens are declaring the glory of God. What is he saying? God's creation is revealing who he is. That's exactly what Paul is describing in Romans chapter 1. That through his creation, we look up and we say, wow, there is an eternal power that has created all this. Something that is beyond this earth. 
Now, it's interesting because even secular scientists have some points that agree with us because they say the universe had a beginning and it will have an end. And we look at that and we go, yeah, that's what we've been saying for hundreds of years, right? Um, they don't want to hear it, though. Uh, but, but we agree on that point. So there's something that's beyond us and beyond this world that created it. Now, they think it's a big explosion, which doesn't make any sense. But when we look at it and we say, man, there is an eternal power, which is God himself who created the universe. And not only that, he is divine in nature. He is divine in nature. So just through creation, we can see these things about God. He begins to reveal himself to the world through his creation. Okay, now, all of us have probably been at one point where we hiked up on some mountain or we sat at some lake or we looked at the sun setting over the ocean, whatever it was, and we saw something, we just said, man, this is amazing, right? That, that, that's, that's the beauty of creation, and it's testifying to us about who God is, right? One of my favorite things when I used to surf was to, to surf in the afternoon and see the sun set over the Pacific Ocean. And you see the sun going down and the waves coming in. It, it is just, it's, it really is, it's awe-inspiring, right, to look at it. And just like, wow, this is so amazing. And then to be able to catch some waves along with that is even better. But, but God is revealing himself through his creation, right? Now, what he says at the end of verse 20, uh, which is really big, he says, after he talks about revealing his eternal power and Godhead, his divine nature, it says, so that they are without excuse. He says that human beings are without excuse to follow God. They're without excuse. Why? Because the creation that they are partaking in reveals who God is. So when they come out and they say, no, no, there is no God. Well, what does the Psalms tell us? The fool says in his heart, there is no God, right? So they have to suppress the truth in order to turn away from the beauty of creation and understand the eternal power and the divine nature of God. And so this is why God brings his wrath against them, because they're suppressing the truth that's obvious, and it says they are without excuse. So because they have a, a knowledge enough to, to recognize that there is a creator, then they go through and, and they suppress the truth. God says, okay, now you're going to experience my wrath. And so God begins to reveal his wrath because of this, right? Now it gets worse. Verse 21, it says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So these guys go through, and it says they knew God. They knew God. This is the word gnosko. It's one of the stronger words for knowledge in the Greek. But it talks about being able to know somebody. And it says they knew God. That's powerful. They knew God from creation. But it says they did not glorify him as God. Okay? Now we throw around that word glory and glorify all the time. What does it actually mean? The word glorify, it means to recognize, to honor, or to praise. Okay? So when we're glorifying God, what are we doing? We are recognizing him for who he is. He is the creator of all the world. He is awesome in power. He is all-knowing, all-present. He is all-powerful. And we look at him, we go, wow, he is amazing. So we begin to recognize him for who he is, and we begin to praise him and thank him for what he's done. Okay? That means to glorify God. That's why we sing songs together as a church right? We come in here, what are we doing? We're trying to recognize him for who he is. We're praising him for all the good things he's done, right? Their worship is very important. So these guys, they knew God. They recognized him through creation, but they decided, no, no, no we're not going to praise him. We're not going to give him the recognition due his name, the honor that he should receive. They're not going to do it. That's trouble. And then it says not only that, but they were not thankful they were ungrateful for all the things that God gave to them. Okay, now this is funny because they wouldn't even have life if it wasn't for God, right? God gave them the very life that they choose to reject their creator. And, and now they're, they're saying, no, no, I'm not going to thank you for that. I'm going to go off and live my life. 
And, and God says, hey, hey, I'm revealing myself to you. Don't, don't do that. And they're, no, no. And they begin to suppress the truth and turn away from him. And then he says, okay, then you're going to face my wrath, right? And God is so patient. What we read about in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, with God, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. God is so patient. That's why he hasn't come and destroyed the world yet, right? He's going to come and he's going to wipe everything out. He says, even the elements, the very elements of, of the world are going to melt, but not yet. Why? Because God's desiring for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So he's so patient, waiting, crying out, revealing himself to people that they would be able to come to him. And they keep turning away, not glorifying him, not recognizing him, and not being thankful for the very life and all the blessings that they receive, right? Like we talked about the rain, right? We got people who are farmers in here. You, you need rain. We need rain to have uh, the crops. We need rain just for the grass so you can have your cows and your animals can eat, right? God pours it out upon us, and they receive of it. It's common grace, and yet there's no thankfulness. There's no gratitude that's going to God, okay? So this is getting really heavy, right? And it says not only that, but the end of verse 21, it says, they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, okay? This word futile, it means to make vain or useless. It is destitute of all wisdom, so now their thoughts are becoming vain. They're, they're concerned about things that are not truly important. That's what we see in the world today, right? People fighting over who can be offended more than anyone else, right? And then people fighting for the right for you to be offended. And you're like, what? Like, you're not even offended, but you want to fight for them to be able to be offended. Why don't you look at a job? Go do something, right? Too much idleness. Um, but their, their thoughts become futile, empty, vain. And it says, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So we talked about the fool, the fool says there is no God, right? And it says their foolish hearts were darkened. The word, the word darkened, it means to darken or to become obscure, right? So now their hearts start to turn away from the light. Now you remember that Jesus came, he said that he is the light of the world. And so as they darken their hearts and they turn it away, they're turning away from the light, which is Jesus, the only way of salvation. So this is a really serious thing as we see these guys rejecting the truth and going deeper and deeper into sin. It doesn't do anything good for them as they start to reject God. It just makes their hearts and their minds foolish, right? All right. <clears throat> At this point, I, I want to talk about, we're almost done I want to give you three words um, that are used. In the New Testament, there are three words used in the Greek to talk about our hearts and the Holy Spirit and how we can do something negative towards the Holy Spirit. And so this is important because these guys are turning away. And so I think there's a word that explains this, okay? So in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, this is the story of Stephen. Stephen, the very first martyr, he stands before the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling council of Jerusalem, and he begins to share the story of Jerusalem, of, of the, the people of Israel. And as he goes through, he's making a point. These guys continually turned away from God and hardened their hearts. And so at the end of his message, as he's going through and recounting the history, he gets to this point, Acts 7.51. He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. So he was saying the people of Israel, he counts all the failures as he goes through. He said they resisted the work of God over and over again. And he says, that's exactly what you guys are doing because you guys are rejecting Jesus Christ. And so he stands up and just completely condemns the Sanhedrin. This is the ruling council, the religious elite of the day. And he's like, you guys are all done. You guys are all rejecting God. Well, what does he say? He says, you always resist, resist. And that means to oppose, right? You're always opposing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to do this, and you say, no, I don't want that. You're opposing the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, who is revealing Jesus as Messiah, right? And these guys missed it. The people who should have known, the people who knew the scriptures the best, they missed it because of their pride and their hard hearts, right? So this is one of the words. People can resist the Holy Spirit. Uh, another word that we see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Paul says this to the Ephesian church. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He goes on to explain that a little bit in the next two verses. But he says you can grieve. Grieving literally means to make sad. You can sadden the Holy Spirit. And he talks about certain ways you can do that in the next couple of verses. He talks about being unforgiving, unloving, right? To being, being harsh with people. That's how you start to grieve the Holy Spirit, okay? We don't want to do that, obviously, ever. And then the last one is 1 Thessalonians 5.19, very short verse. He says, do not quench the Spirit, okay? Do not quench the Spirit. Quench means to put out. It's like the idea of putting out a fire, some of you guys know what we're talking about. You build a big fire out in the backyard or when you're going camping. And what happens at night, you, you got to put that fire out. Otherwise, maybe an ember comes in and lands on your tent, melts the tent, or starts a fire out in the brush. Can't have that, right? You have to put that fire out. This is what that word means. He said some of us are putting out the Holy Spirit. We're quenching the Holy Spirit, right? So we want to make sure that we're not doing any of this. Because what we see in Romans chapter 1, this is what the people are doing. The people are churning away from God, suppressing the truth, clearly resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's going to bring consequences on them, and the consequences are are enormous, right? All right. Last two verses, back in the passage, Romans 1, verse 22 and 23. So it says, after they darkened their hearts and their minds, it says, they professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So although their thoughts became futile and their hearts were darkened, they professed to be wise. So they told people how wise they were. That's what we see today. People talking about how wise they are. And what we see is the world has tons of knowledge and very, very little wisdom. Very little. And so these guys, they were the predecessors of people today who were acting like that. They professed to be wise, but they weren't. And they became fools instead. And it says they changed the glory of the incorruptible God. And so when it talks about changing, what they're doing is they're exchanging one thing for another. The Greek word means to exchange one thing for another. So they take the glory of God and they exchange it for something that's different. And what is it? For the the image of a corruptible man or a bird or a four-footed creature or creeping things. And so what is he talking about? He's talking about idolatry. So now, instead of looking at the true and living God, the creator of the universe, now they go through and they begin to create little statues. They say, this is my God. Well, how can it be your God if you just created that? Or you ordered some other guy to create it for you. And they would make it, you know, all throughout the, the Old Testament, especially in, in Isaiah, I think about, they, they talk about these statues. And they say, they've got eyes, but they don't see. They've got ears, but they can't hear. They've got mouths, but they don't speak. And yet you worship them. At one point they say, you, you cut down a tree to make your idol, and, and you, you cut it off, and this is your, your God. But then with the other half of the tree, you make a fire to warm yourself, and you burn it. That doesn't even make any sense. But that's what goes on. When people are involved in idolatry, there's no logic going on. They're just, it's pure emotion that's going on. Well, I, I need to have something to worship, so I will create this little bug. You know, here's my flying ladybug. I will worship it and adore it. That's not, that's not God, right? That's something that you created. So God is the eternal in power and divine in nature. And what we see that Jesus told us is that God is spirit and no one has seen him at any time. This is why making idols is so important in the Old Testament. They say, don't do it, right? It's part of the Ten Commandments because you, you, there's no image that represents God except for in the New Testament, which is Jesus himself, right? He is the bodily image of God. But in creation, there's nothing that represents God. There's nothing. We see that we can see God through his creation, but you can't have something and say, this is what God is like. No, he's spirit. You can't have something physical and have it represent something spiritual, right? And so that's what they did. They exchanged an incorruptible God for the image of a corruptible man. That word corruptible and incorruptible talks about the ability of our flesh to literally rot, right? As we die, our bodies begin to decay. 
God cannot decay. God will not rot away someday. God is eternal. So we start to make images of things that are rotting or corruptible will eventually one day rot. And we say, okay, that doesn't make sense because that doesn't represent who God is. That's why idolatry is such a serious thing. So as these guys begin to suppress the truth, what happens? They begin to turn away from God. They begin to darken their hearts and their thoughts become futile. And they begin to turn towards idolatry away from the true and living God. And then this is why God begins to reveal his wrath in their lives. So this is really um, some heavy stuff that's going on here right at the beginning of Romans. Next week, what we're going to see is what is the specific punishment, the specific wrath that God brings against them. And when we see it, it's, gonna, it's, it's a passage that I wish I didn't have to teach, but it's in here, and we're going to go through it, and it's heavy. So um, you, don't, you guys don't want to miss it, even though it's going to be a little bit heavy. It, it is interesting to see. I want to leave you with one last verse, Proverbs 21.30. Proverbs 21.30. It says, there is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. Okay? There's no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel, no nothing that goes against the Lord. But these guys, they were professing to be wise. They're talking about how wise they are, and yet they're creating things that go against the Lord and against his commandments. Okay? That cannot be. So it's proving their foolishness. There's no real counsel against the God. There, there's nothing that can actually stand against the Lord. Nothing. So when you hear people trying to prove that God doesn't exist and showing all these things, they're just, it's their foolish minds professing to be wise, but real wisdom never goes against God. Real wisdom comes from God, right? So as we see this, we see God's judgment and his wrath coming. Hopefully this kind of stirs us up a little bit. Even preparing this and studying this, it's kind of like, wow, this is, it's so heavy, you know? And uh, this obviously gives us the opportunity to celebrate what we have in Jesus Christ, that all of this wrath is removed from us and was put on Jesus on the cross so that we don't have to experience this, right? And we praise God for that. Now, um, hopefully, as we continue to go through and you guys keep coming, we will see the transition from these heavy sins into the grace and the goodness of God as we move to the end of chapter three and especially the beginning of chapter four, all right? So we've got good things to look forward to, even though tonight was not so encouraging, right? All right, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much uh, for the Apostle Paul and the work of your Holy Spirit through him that inspired this book and begins to reveal this stuff to us. And we thank you so much that you are a God who loves us and wants to reveal yourself to us and to all creation. And I pray that if there's anyone out there listening, that they would open their hearts uh, to the truth and not turn away from you, but they'd be able to believe in you and accept the forgiveness that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So please open our hearts and guide us and uh, bless this study as we continue through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.